What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. This is my full card breakdown and prediction video for UFC 303. We have Alex Pereira going against Yuri Prohashka too. And yeah, this is a phenomenal card. Really looking forward to this card from a fan perspective, from a betting perspective. This is a card that has completely changed throughout the month of June. And uh, we got a shout out at the UFC, right? Like this was originally supposed to be Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler. A lot of people are looking forward to that fight, including me. But if, we, if we're going to get a replacement, if that fight's going to fall off, what better fight to put than Alex Pereira, Jiri Prohashka, you know, going after it again? I mean, this is a fight that I'm really, really looking forward to. The first fight was awesome. I think the second fight is going to be awesome as well. And then we have some fun fights scattered throughout the card. So, yeah, really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to breaking it down. Sorry I'm getting it out a day late. I wanted to dive a lot deeper into some of these matchups because I'm going to have... Um, a lot of action on this card, so wanted to take an extra day, uh, try to get all the reads in play before I got out with the video, so hopefully uh, it, it works out, hopefully it works out this week. So before we get into it, if you guys could like the video, subscribe to the channel, I'm bringing back the Significant Strike Contest since it is a pay-per-view card. To enter the Significant Strike Contest, leave a like, subscribe, and then comment down how many Significant Strikes you think that Alex Pereira and Yuri Prohashka are going to combine for uh, $25 to first. And if you get it on the dot, I'm going to double the prize to $50. Nobody's been able to get it on the dot like the last couple pay-per-views. So hopefully somebody gets it this week. Again, uh, comment down those significant strikes, and we'll see who gets close. Uh, tie, tiebreaker goes to the person that comments first as well. So other than that, if you guys want more content or if you want to support me more, DFSbythenumbers.com is the best way to do that. Uh, pretty sure I'm going to be getting out a lot of early content, have a bunch of bets already, so check that out. And yeah, also check out Prize Picks. Use promo code DFSBTN. I'll be getting out a Prize Picks video later in the week as well for UFC 303. But yeah, let's get into this card. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a card that I'm going to have just a lot of action on. I'm going to probably have more action on this card than I've had on any other card in June and then combined. Um, I already have nine bets on this card, eight units on the line. Of course, I'll be touching on those for the betting breakdown video out Friday. But if you do want the bets early, you know where to get them. All right, so I say we get right into it. We have a lot of fights to break down. We're going to start with the first fight of the card, and it is going to be an absolute banger. Like, this is one of my favorite fights on the entire card, and we're kicking the night off right. We got Ricky Simone taking on Vinicius Oliveira. We got Ricky Simone, 31 years old, 5'6", with a 70-inch reach, 20-5, and five, and 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Vinicius Oliveira, 28 years old, 5'9", with a 70-and-a-half-inch reach, 20-3, and three, and 4-1. and one. In his last five fights, we'll take a look at the odds. Ricky Simone opened up minus 245. He's currently a minus 210 favorite. And Vinicius Oliveira opened up as a plus 210 underdog. And he's currently a plus 180 underdog. So, yeah, there's obviously a lot of hype on Vinicius Oliveira. How can there not be after what he did in, first of all, on the Contender Series? I don't think his knockout on the Contender Series gets talked um, about enough because he went out there and destroyed that guy. Like, I actually felt really bad for his opponent in that one because... Uh, it was it was a brutal knock. I forget what the dude's name was, uh, Madr Madrigal. But yeah, in his debut, he went out there and got what could be knockout of the year when it's all said and done against poor Bernardo Sopai. And it was a vicious, it was a vicious flying knee. I thought maybe Keith Peterson could have maybe stopped the the fight prior to that. Sopai really had nothing left. And then just a sec a couple seconds later, you're like, Keith, what are you doing? And then a couple seconds later, it's like, yeah, Sopai potentially died. Uh, luckily, he didn't die. Um, he was able to re recover and and eventually get up, but that was one of the nastiest knees I think I've ever seen in my entire life. But like I think a lot of people are just forgetting about what happened in those first ten minutes of the fight, and what happened was was honestly not good. Um, I actually pick Sopai in that matchup. Sopai is somebody that I do like. Sopai is somebody that I think has some some upside as a young guy. But I picked Sopai to go out there and, and potentially knock out Oliveira on the feet. I like the striking of Sopai, right? Not ever did I think that Sopai would go out there and, and take down Oliveira and, and do what he did to him, right? Like, uh, Sopai took down Oliveira twice in the first round, and he got into mount instantly on one of the takedowns. It's like, what's going on? And then the second round, Sopai absolutely is dominating Vinicius Oliveira for the majority of that round. He's taken the back multiple times. He's getting into very dominant positions. He's nearly finishing the fight. And I thought he was going to finish him at some point. And then all of a sudden, Sopai falls off a cliff, and then we get that knockout. But yeah, those first 10 minutes, I they can't be ignored, or at least I'm not ignoring them. It was a horrible look. Ricky Simone, 
Um, this is a, a big step up from Bernardo Sopai, some of these other guys, to Ricky Simone, who I think is a much, much better wrestler than Sopai. And then I also think he's a much better grappler than Sopai. Ricky Simone's a black belt in BJJ, has multiple subs on his record in the UFC, has some knockouts as well. So, yeah, I think Simone is going to implement his will, get this fight down to the mat, and I think he can dominate here. I mean, if Bernardo Sopai is doing that to you on the mat, I think Simone can get this guy down, get into a dominant position, and, and finish the fight. So, yeah, of course, on the feet, Oliveira has a ton of power. Simone is going to want to wrestle, but I feel like I can count on Simone to do that. Give me Ricky Simone to win this fight and win it by second round head and arm choke. All right, moving on. And sorry for the jump scare. I don't know what's I don't know what's going on in that picture with uh, Saruya. Kind of looks like my uh, Liang Na wig, so maybe I should bring it back for this fight, but geez. Uh, but anyway, we got Ray Saruya going against Carlos Hernandez. We got Saruya, 22 years old, 5'6", with a 68-inch reach, 9-0, and 5-0 and and in his last five fights. Carlos Hernandez, 30 years old, 5'8", with a 67-inch reach, 9-3, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. Saruya is the second biggest favorite on the entire card. He opened up minus 400. He's currently a minus 500 favorite. As far as Carlos Hernandez, he opened up plus 275. He is now a plus 375 underdog. And yeah, you wouldn't expect a guy with a haircut like that to be this much of a favorite. But I went and watched Saruya, his road to UFC fights. He had three of them. I watched some other fights outside of that. And I was, like, very impressed with the guy. So um, there are some red flags, of course. So this is going to be, you know, an interesting test against Carlos Hernandez, who's so-so. You know, Carlos Hernandez has been in there with some good fighters. He has some losses against some good fighters. He has some wins against some okay fighters. He's kind of good everywhere, good boxing. You know, BJJ's okay. Takedown defense, not great, but he's kind of just an okay fighter. I don't think he's going to be this guy. Carlos Hernandez is like in the top 10 at any point in time soon or ever, really. And I also don't think he doesn't deserve to be here in the UFC. So it's an interesting matchup. Saruya, he's uh, very one-dimensional. I don't think I've seen him land one strike at distance. Um, I probably have, but I forgot about it because it, it just doesn't happen a lot. Um, this is a guy that's going to shoot takedowns with probably in the first 15 to 20 seconds of this fight. So yeah, extremely one-dimensional, um, but he's very good at, at what he does, and that's getting the fight down to the mat. Apparently, he has a wrestling background. You can see it. His uh, takedowns are very good. His wrestling's very good. I love the timing. He can absolutely get you down. So I, I love the wrestling, but not only the wrestling, the grappling is incredible. I'm like, this guy is slick on the mat. Just absolutely slick on the mat. Um, was able to get um, a couple submissions on road to UFC. And yeah, he's very, very dominant on the ground. Some solid ground and pound as well. But yeah, like I said, this is a, a, a tough, a tougher test than some of these guys he has been facing. Uh, Saruya's cardio is a little bit iffy. We saw him go to decision in one of his road to UFC fights. His cardio kind of fell off a little bit, but I don't like that. And of course, the fact that I don't really see much striking, I don't like that. But I don't think any of that matters. I think Saruya is going to take down Carlos Hernandez. I think he's going to do it quite easily. And once he does, I think he's going to probably get into dominant position to get submission opportunities. Carlos Hernandez is not easy to sub. He did go against uh, Barres on the Contender Series. He was able to fend off a bunch of submissions. He did get subbed by Alon Nascimento, um, which, you know, no shame in that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm curious to see if Saruya is able to get Carlos Hernandez out of there. If he does, he does. If he doesn't, I think this fight could get interesting in these last seven and a half minutes. So, yeah, the price tag on Saruya is kind of kind of wide in that aspect of things, but I'm going to take Saruya to win this fight. I'll say he does get him down and find the submission in the first seven and a half minutes, and, and we'll kind of go through, through uh, go from there. So, give me Saruya. Give me Saruya to win this fight by first round sub. Oh, boy. Uh, we got Martin Budai. Going against Andre Arlovsky, uh, we got Martin Budai, who is uh, 32 years old, six foot four with a 77 inch reach, 13 and two, and four and one in his last five fights. Andre Arlovsky, 45 years old, six foot three with a 77 inch reach, 34 and 23 and two and three in his last five fights. Martin Budai, massive favorite. Well, he opened up a massive, massive favorite. He opened up minus 400, and he's now minus 255. Andre Arlovsky opened up plus 330. He's currently plus 215, and I'm already frustrated. I'm already frustrated. This fight hasn't even happened. I haven't even bet on this fight yet, but I'm frustrated because I probably will bet on this fight, and I'm, I can already see myself yelling at the TV because Martin Budai can make this look so easy. Martin Budai can look minus 1,000 here if he does this one thing, and that one thing is going to be just get the fight down to the mat, Martin Budai. Get the fight down to the mat. 
Martin Budai just got his black belt in BJJ. He has not used much grappling. I know he submitted uh, Josh Parisian, I think, in the UFC. But, like, I'm watching Martin Budai's fights before coming into the UFC, and it's like, he's attempting double legs. He's, he's getting them. He's getting on top. His ground and pound is dominant. This guy's extremely heavy. He cuts down to 265. He's six foot four. Um, like, he's really good on top. He has a good submission game as well. Multiple submissions in, in, on his record for Budai. Like, if he takes down Andre Arlovsky, the fight is going to be over extremely shortly after. Because any time we've seen Andre Arlovsky grapple in the last seven years, it's been horrible. I mean, and I know they're against good good grapplers like Tom Aspinall, but it's not the fact that, you know, getting subbed by Tom Aspinall is not a bad thing. Getting subbed in five seconds by Tom Aspinall, that wasn't the best look. Like, I, I, I kid you not. Aspinall takes down Arlovsky. I'm looking at the clock counting, and within five seconds, Andre Arlovsky taps, insta-taps, against, Arlo- or against uh, Aspinall, and then against Marcos Adair de Lima. De Lima <laughs> sinks in the choke. I don't even know if the choke was under under the, the chin, um, and Arlovsky taps instantly. If Budai gets this fight down to the mat, he is going to tap out Arlovsky, but the problem with Budai is it's not always that simple with him. There's some fights where he wants to stay at range for 15 minutes. I mean, if he does that, he's losing this fight. Whether he wins it, the judge we know who the judges are going to give it to. The crooked, corrupt, blind judges. They're giving it to Arlovsky. Because this is probably his retirement fight. The whole crowd's going to be behind him. But if Budai wants to make this look easy, if, if Budai was, was smart at all, he's getting this fight down to the mat. So I'll say that Martin Budai makes a, a good decision in this fight. He pushes Arlovsky against the cage. He takes him down. And he finds the sub. So give me Martin Budai to win this fight. I'll take him to win this fight by second round sub. He needs a win here. I mean, he got embarrassed in his last fight against Shamil Gaziv. And he needs a win. And he needs a dominant one. And this is uh, this would be a great win for him. I mean, Arlovsky's been there, done that, been champion before. And this, this is a very winnable fight. Arlovsky, 45 years old. He's been finished 15, 16 times. So we'll see. We'll see if Boudet gets it done, but this is it's a terrifying, it's a terrifying fight to bet on. I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Next, we got a fight that is, like, honestly, one of the tougher fights on the card to call. So we got Jillian Robertson going against Michelle Watterson Gomez. And we got Robertson, 29 years old, 5'5", five five with a 63-inch reach, 13-8, and eight, and 3-2 and two in her last five fights. Michelle Watterson Gomez, she is 38 years old, 5'3", with a 62-inch reach, 18-12, and 1-4. and, one and four. In her last five fights, Robertson opened up minus 300. She's now minus 170. Michelle Watterson Gomez opened up plus 250. She's now a plus 145 underdog. And this fight is extremely tricky because, you know, Watterson, she's not only not only is she 38 years old, but it's just the the results for Watterson, like the results, the last really the last six years, they have not been great in the last six years. She is one, two, three, four, five, six, six and one. No, one and six. One and six. One and she's one and six in her last seven fights. Holy crap! And her one win was against Angela Hill in a split decision that could have gone either way. So it's like holy crap, man! Like, and then you look at this fight stylistically, and it's like if if Watterson's able to stuff these takedowns, she's going to to win the fight it's just will she be able to stuff every single takedown attempt coming away from Robertson Uh, Michelle Watterson Gomez she does have very good takedown defense she showed that off in the Esparza fight back in 2020 which was four years ago at this point and again she's she's taken a lot of damage um in a lot of these fights I mean that Rodriguez fight was kind of hard to watch uh I don't know what to do here um I guess I am going to go Robertson here because like one takedown, it could be it. If if Robertson gets one takedown, I think she smokes Michelle Watterson Gomez. And what I can count on Robertson to do is she's she's not going to go out there and point fight uh, Michelle Watterson for 15 minutes. She's going to at the very least attempt multiple takedowns. Will she get one? It is yet to be seen. But then I'm looking through Robertson's career, and it's like she's getting a lot of takedowns. She's gotten at least one takedown. In her last like seven fights, so just give me give me one takedown, and I think at this point of Watterson's career, if Robertson does get her down, I think she's gonna serve her on the on the mat. So give me Robertson to win this fight, and I'm gonna take her to win this fight by second round submission. 
Moving on, we have Peyton Talbot going against Yanis Yamagori. We got Peyton Talbot, 25 years old, 5'10", with a 70-inch reach, 8-0, and 5-0 and in his last five fights. Gamori, he is 29 years old, 5'9", with a 69-inch reach, 12-2, and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. Peyton Talbot opened up minus 600. He's currently minus 2,000. Uh, and Yanis Gamori, he opened up as a plus 450 underdog, and he is currently plus 1,000. So... Yeah, I'm curious to see where this line goes throughout the week. I doubt it gets any wider than minus 2,000 here, but when it's all said and done, maybe we, we get the biggest favorite in UFC history here in Peyton Talbot. But, yeah, I mean, there's not much to say here. Peyton Talbot's going to gonna wreck this guy. I don't give Gamori much of a chance in this fight. Gamori, he can grapple a little bit, but that's not really his game. I've seen him get takedowns here or there. He's primarily a striker that is low volume. Um, he looks decent in some of his fights, but it's against a low-level competition. In his debut against um, William Gomi, it was a horrible fight. Like, all William, William Gomi fights are, are just terrible. Um, but this fight in particular was extremely terrible, where Gomi actually outlanded this guy 2-1. to one. And if you're getting outlanded 2-1 to one by William Gomi, something must, must seriously be up. Like, you have to try to get outlanded by a guy like William Gomi who throws nothing. So, yeah, low volume, Gamori. I don't like the striking defense. He holds his chin way up in the air. Um, doesn't really seem to like getting pressured as well, which he's going to be getting a lot of pressure in this matchup, a lot more than, than William Gomi. So, yeah, this should be Talbot, and I think Talbot breaks him as the fight goes on. Uh, I'm curious to see how Talbot approaches this fight, because in his last fight against Cameron Simon, we, we saw something that we haven't really seen before. It, it was Talbot going out there and starting early. He's typically a 2-3 guy. Um, so I'm curious to see what happens in that aspect of things. But yeah, Talbot wins this fight. He wins it inside the distance. It's just kind of which round does he do it is kind of the, the big question here. I'm going to say he does it in round two and gets it done by second round knockout. Moving on to the next fight, a very underrated fight here on the card. We got Charles Jordan going against Gene Silva. We got Charles Jordan, 28 years old, 5'9", with a 69-inch reach, 15, 7, and 1, and 2, and 3 in his last five fights. Gene Silva, 27 years old, 5'7", with a 69-inch reach, 12, and 2, and 5, and 0 in his last five fights. We'll take a look at the odds, and we have Charles Jordan opened up minus 200. He's currently minus 120. Gene Silva opened up plus 170. He's currently a plus 100 underdog. And yeah, this I don't see how this fight isn't extremely fun. We got two strikers going at it, and both these guys are going to stand there and, and trade for the full 15 minutes or until somebody falls. This is a big step up in competition for Gene Silva. Um, he had a decent win on the Contender Series as like a really big underdog against Kevin Vallejos. I actually picked him as an underdog in that matchup against Vallejos who I'm just not entirely sold on. He went out there and lost the first round, but won the, the second and third. Kind of a slow start in that matchup, but the 2-3 for uh, Silva in that matchup was really good to see. And then against Weston Wilson, he went out there and knocked him out in the first round. But yeah, this is a much tougher test here. He's going against Charles Jordan, who I think people are very low on after his last fight against Sean Woodson, where, yeah, he kind of dropped the ball in that fight. It's like, that was probably Charles Jordan's worst performance in his entire career. Like, win win or loss, like, that was the worst performance, the worst uh, the worst Charles Jordan we've ever seen, because not only did he lose that fight, it's like, he didn't try. He didn't really try in that fight. It was it was horrible to watch. Um, you know, he, a judge even scored the fight for Jordan, which I think is hilarious, but yeah, Judge actually scored the fight for Jordan, and there's there's no way, there's no chance he won that fight. But yeah, it was a, it was a trash uh, performance from Jordan. But you know, prior to that, he's choking out Ricardo Ramos, who's an elite black belt in BJJ. Prior to that, he had that performance against Crone Gracie, where it wasn't the most exciting fight, but he won. And he's had some good wins, some good wins and some good losses against some good guys as well. So this is absolutely a step up in competition for Gene Silva, and I think it's going to be a competitive fight. I think that these guys are going to stand and bang. I think as this fight goes on, it's going to get very interesting because Charles Jordan's a guy that kind of grows into the fight, gets better and better. And then we see in every single round three for Charles Jordan, this guy's a, a madman. I'll never forget, you know, fights like the Yule fight where he was fighting like um, just a complete man possessed in that fight. Uh, in the uh, Burgos fight, even in a fight he lost, 
in that Burgos fight went crazy in the third round and landed 84 significant strikes in the th in the third round against Burgos. And don't forget about what he did to poor Marcelo Rojo in the third round where he just beat the brakes off of him and, and stopped the fight in that third round there. So... Yeah, um, I'm going to go Jordan here. I know it's going to be a very unpopular pick. Silva seems to be uh, the dog of the week, but, you know, Gene Silva he hasn't really proven anything to me. There's, like, no tape on there out, uh, of this guy. The only tape we see is that Contender Series fight and the Weston Wilson fight. This is a, a much bigger, big, big step up in competition here. And it's not like Jordan's a washed bum. He's only 28 years old. So I'm taking Jordan here. I think he's going to win this fight by decision. Maybe elite finish, but I'll say decision for Charles Jordan. Next, we have probably like one of the best fights on the card here, and it is on the prelims. Um, just in terms of pure like entertainment standpoint, this is one of the better fights on the entire card. It is Andre Feely going against Cub Swanson. We got Andre Feely, who is uh, 34 years old, five foot eleven with a 74 inch reach, 23 and 11, and two and three in her last fight. In his last five, I called him Feely a, a girl. He's not a girl. Um. Cub Swanson is 40 years old, 5 foot 8 with a 70 inch reach, 29 and 13 and 3 and 2 in his last 5 fights. Let's take a look at the odds. We have a big favor here in Feely. Feely opened up wow, uh he opened up plus 120. He's currently minus 205 and then as far as Swanson, he opened up minus 140. He's currently plus 175. And uh yeah, um Cub Swanson, 40 years old at this point. So I think somebody's getting served in this matchup. You know, the unders are getting kind of crushed as we speak. I think somebody's getting served. It's just it's who's who's getting served in this matchup. Because Cub Swanson, I think he's durable in terms of, like, the head strikes. I think he can take a shot to, like, the head. But to the body is uh, a big, big problem at this point for Cub Swanson. I think he's kind of weak to the body. And I think he's weak to the legs at this point. We saw Giga completely fold him with the body kick, which is Giga. That's fair. But Andre Feely has some good body kicks in his own right. And then we saw Martinez just batter his legs, right? So, yeah, the the, the legs, the leg work of Feely, the body work of Feely, I think, can pose Swanson some problems here. But I'm worried about Feely's durability. I mean, I know Cub Swanson's 40 and all, but Feely is a guy that I think his chin has always been questionable, but even more so. Like, this guy's been knocked out how many times? He's been hurt and dropped how many times? And Cub Swanson at even 40 years old, right? Like, the last thing to go is power, and Cub Swanson still has a lot of power. The Darren Elkins fight. Nobody's knocking out Darren Elkins, and Cub Swanson did it in about a minute. And even in the uh, Hakeem Dewadu fight, Cub Swanson rocks Dewadu bad at the end of the second round. So it's like if these guys are going to go out there and stand and bang until one man falls, I don't necessarily get this line. I thought originally I might be on that Feely side because Swanson is 40, but in a fight where I think these two are going to just stand and bang, I'm going to pick Swanson here. I'm going to pick Swanson to go out there and knock out Andre Feely. I think somebody's getting knocked out. I think somebody's getting served. Uh, one last ride. One last ride with Mr. Cub Swanson as a big dog, and I'll take him to win by first-round knockout. Next, we have Joe Pfeiffer going against Marc-Andre Barrio. We got Joe Pfeiffer, 27 years old, 6'2", with a 75-inch reach, 12-3, and and 4-1 and in his last five fights. Marc-Andre Barrio, 34 years old, 6'1", with a 74-inch reach, 16-7, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. All right, sorry, I got a I got a weird text message. Just got a weird text message just now. Unbelievable. Uh, any anyway, let's let's get back to the video. So we have Pfeiffer as a really big favorite here, kind of a surprisingly big favorite. But yeah, he opened up minus two forty. He's currently minus two seventy. And Mark Andre Barrio opened up plus two hundred five. He's currently plus two thirty. And yeah, I think this is a spot where Joe Pfeiffer does get back on track here. He took a big step up in competition against Jacker Manson. And I went back and watched that fight, and he didn't look as bad as I originally remembered. Like Pfeiffer was winning, like the first round, two rounds. You know, was looking good early. It's just as the fight went on, it was a five round fight. He slowed down, and Hermanson was able to kind of take over. So yeah, not the the best the best look in the world. But hey, this is a three round fight. It's against a much different opponent and Mark andre Barrio. And I just think Pfeiffer has a lot more ways to win this fight. I think he can win it by any which method. I think he can win by knockout. 
Although Mark Andre Barrio is extremely tough, extremely durable. We have seen him knocked out before. He got knocked out in like 15 seconds by cheating and Jaquani. Pfeiffer has a lot of power. These guys are going to stand and, and trade. I think a Pfeiffer knockout is, is on the table. I think a Pfeiffer sub is on the table. Pfeiffer can wrestle. We've seen Mark Andre Barrio taken down. We've seen him sub before. I think a Pfeiffer sub is on the table. And then if this fight does go 15 minutes, Pfeiffer can wrestle. Pfeiffer can land big shots. Um, so yeah, I think Pfeiffer has a lot of ways to win this fight. But Mark Andre Barrio, he's like, no, he's no bum. He's going to throw a lot of volume. He's extremely tough. He has great cardio. If this was a five-round fight, it could be a different story, but it's a three-round fight. Give me Pfeiffer to win this fight. If I had to pick an official method, I'll say by submission, uh, second-round sub for Joe Pfeiffer here. <laughs> Moving on, we have Ian Machado Gary going against Michael Page. We got Ian Machado Gary, 26 years old, six foot three, with a 74-inch reach, 14 and 0, and 5 and 0. In his last five fights, Michael Page, 37 years old, six foot three, with a 79-inch reach, 22 and 2, and 4 and 1. In his last five fights, Ian Gary is the favorite. He opened up as a minus 115 favorite. He's currently minus 135. Page opened up minus 105. He's currently a plus 115 underdog. So what I like about a lot of these fights on the main card is they're all very closely lined fights. And so it's a tricky fight here because I feel like Ian Gary has a lot of ways to win this fight. Um, you know, I was very impressed with the striking of Michael Page. This guy has very unique striking. Like I haven't seen you know anything like it. He's just very long, very rangy first and foremost, and he's either all the way in or all the way out. But a lot of times he is all the way out, and then he'll blitz in with a punch or an elbow like he did in the Holland fight. And I was watching that fight back, and it's like, man, if, if Michael Page lands some of these shots that he landed on Gary, he is going to knock Gary out, especially that spinning back elbow he landed against Kevin Holland. Um, I felt that just, just watching it. Uh, Kevin Holland, though, next level durable, whereas Gary, not so much. We've seen him hurt multiple times and drop. So, yeah, I think if this fight stays standing, this is a very, very close fight, and I'm interested to see what it looks like. But, yeah, if this fight stays standing, Paige absolutely has a chance to land a big shot and knock out Gary, in my opinion. But um, I have a sneaky suspicion, very sneaky suspicion, that Gary might try to to grapple here. I think that would be very wise for Gary to do. Um, he's been training at Shoot to Box, Diego Lima, with, with Charles Oliveira in them. He's coming in there with, I imagine, maybe the blonde hair uh, that Charles Oliveira and the guys come in with. And if he takes down Michael Page, I think he can have a, a pretty big advantage. Like, Gary, he can grapple, doesn't use it much in the UFC, but he can grapple. And Michael Page, we saw him in the, the Storley fight getting taken down multiple times. We saw him in the Holland fight get taken down and Holland was you know getting kind of kind of close kind of close to a sub uh, but Page was able to get back up I feel like you know Gary should go out there and get takedowns and if he does I think that I think that sub could be super live I see people playing the sub for Gary and it makes sense because that is certainly a path for Gary and I feel like like why wouldn't he why wouldn't he at least try to do that because on the feet I don't think this is one-way traffic in favor of Ian Machado Gary but if it gets to the mat gets to the ground then it could look one-way traffic so i'm going to take ian gary here i'm going to take him to win this fight by second round submission i'll say he gets this fight down to the mat and finds a submission at some point in this fight here so give me gary gary submission round two and on prize picks there is something sticking out very early in the week it is the ian gary less than 62.5 significant strikes just because i see a million ways of this going less and if it goes more, uh, I'd actually be kind of surprised because, first of all, I think this fight finishes. I think uh, Page can land a big shot and knock out Gary, and then I also think Gary can land a big shot and knock out Page or sub him. And then uh, another reason is Michael Venom Page does a really good job at not getting hit. Probably the best job I've ever seen at not getting hit because, like I said, he's all the way out and then he'll blitz in with a combination or a big shot. So, yeah, I think this goes less. Uh, I could see, like, not a ton happening at range. And like I said, I can see a finish as well. So, yeah, give me the less on these significant strikes for Ian Gary. Something sticking out nice and early in the week. Moving on to the next fight, we got Mara Bueno Silva going against Macy Chiazon. We got Mario Bueno Silva, 32 years old, 5'6", with a 66 and a half inch reach, 10 and 3, and 3, 1 and 1, no contest in his last five, in her last five fights. Maisie Chazon, 32 years old, 5'11", with a 72 inch reach, 9 and 3, and 3 and 2 in her last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds. Massive, massive line movement here. Maisie Chazon now is the slight underdog. She opened at minus 220. 
She is now plus 100. Maisie Chazon opened up plus 165. She is currently minus 120. And this is a very interesting matchup because you can make a case for Chazon in terms of minute winning ability. Chazon is, is going to be the minute winner here. You know, Maisie Chazon can win minutes up against the cage. Maisie Chazon can win minutes at range. Maisie Chazon can win minutes on top of Mara Bueno Silva. The big problem I have in this matchup for Chazon is just how dangerous Mara Bueno Silva is once the fight gets to the mat. Mara Bueno Silva has like six or seven submissions in the UFC. I think it's six, but maybe seven if you count the Holly Holm submission win that got turned into a no contest. Uh, she only has one decision win, and it comes against Yanan Wu. And even in that fight, she attempted two subs. Like, I have a feeling this fight is going to take place a lot in control time positions for a couple reasons. For one, a lot of Macy's fights do take place in control time positions, whether she's on top or on bottom or against the cage. And then as far as Mara Bueno Silva, off of her back, she's a serious problem. And then on top of that, Mara Bueno Silva is actually starting to wrestle and get takedowns, which I love to see because her ground game is so good. So yeah, I just feel like at some point in this fight, this fight is going to hit the ground. And when it does, we've seen Macy tapped out before. We've seen Macy getting very close to getting tapped out before. Irene Aldana almost tapped her out a couple times in that first round. Raquel Pennington subbed her in the second round. So, yeah, I think there are going to be a lot of opportunities here for Mara Bueno Silva to snatch up an arm, to snatch up a neck at some point in this fight. So I'm going Mara Bueno Silva by sub. But yeah, if this fight goes the distance, I think Macy Chazon's very live. I just think at some point, Silva's going to snatch a neck here. So give me Mara Bueno Silva. I'll take her to win this fight by third round submission. All right, let's, uh, oh, and another prize pick spot I do like here is the less on Mara Bueno Silva, significant strikes. It's set at 45.5. Like I said, I see a lot of this fight taking place in control time positions against the cage, whether she's on top, on bottom, and then I also see this fight finishing personally as well. So give me the less on Mara Bueno Silva, significant strikes. If you guys want to check it out, promo code DFSBTN and get a 100% deposit match up to $100 on prize picks. And then, of course, my prize picks video will be out later in the week. Moving on to the next fight, we have Roman Delidze going against Anthony Smith. We got Delidze, 35 years old, 6'2", with a 76-inch reach, 12-2, and 2-3 and two and three in his last five fights. Anthony Smith, 35 years old, 6'4", with a 76-inch reach, 38-19, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. Delidze opened up minus 170, currently minus 150. Anthony Smith opened up as a plus 145 underdog. He's currently a plus 130 underdog so of course i'm not even gonna get into what the original matchup was for this fight because i literally forget because this fight has changed a million times i know ulberg was supposed to be in this matchup jamal hill was supposed to be in this matchup i mean everybody was supposed to be in the, i think uh roundtree was supposed to be in this matchup just everybody and you know these guys are pulling out guys are getting hurt and then the final form of this fight hopefully is roman de Lidze going against anthony smith so a couple things i want to mention right off the bat this is, this is short notice for both guys. This is short notice for Anthony Smith. This is short notice for Roman Delitzi. So that is not a talking point. It is short notice for both guys. Uh, another talking point I want to, to bring up is the fact that this is at light heavyweight, which, as we know, Delitzi has been cutting down to middleweight his last couple fights. But Delitzi has fought at light heavyweight multiple times. He actually made his debut at light heavyweight. And Roman Delitzi, I think, has fought as high as heavyweight. I think it's a heavyweight fight on his on his record. So, and if anything, I kind of like Delitzi up at light heavyweight a little bit more as well. So, yeah, so this is a light heavyweight fight. Delitzi Smith and... I like Delidze here, and I've never been a really big believer in, in Roman Delidze. You know, he's not the best minute winner in the world, but neither is Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith's won, I think, maybe one or two decisions. I know he had the Ryan Spann decision. Other than that, it's a bunch of finishes, right? Which is interesting because Delidze, I don't know if the guy's finishable. Uh, Delidze has incredible durability. His submission game is is on point. So is Anthony Smith going to finish Delidze? I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, and I think Delidze has some pass here. On the feet, I don't like the low volume of Delidze. I think Anthony Smith's going to be bringing the volume. I think the leg kicks of Anthony Smith can play a factor here. But Delidze has, absolutely has the power advantage. And Delidze absolutely, absolutely has the durability advantage. Uh, Anthony Smith's been finished 15 or 16 times. Whereas Delidze, I'm not sure he's ever going to get finished. He's super tough. And then on top of that, I feel like Delidze has a very clear path to victory, and that's getting takedowns here. Anthony Smith, on paper, 
has a 49% takedown defense, and I'm shocked that it's even that high because he doesn't have any takedown defense. He kind of wants to be on his back in a lot of these fights. We've seen it time and time again in a lot of these fights for Anthony Smith. The Magomed Ankalaya uh, fight, he was able to get, well, he got hurt in that fight, but still, Ankalaya was able to get him down easily. We saw in the um, the Rakic fight, where Rakic was actually credited with zero takedowns in that fight, but he was able to get him down in every single round, and Rakic was able to control him for 12 minutes of that fight, and Rakic got credited with zero takedowns because Anthony Smith provided that much re resistance that they didn't even give Rakic a, a takedown attempt. Glover took him down multiple times. Like, we've seen him taken down time and time and time again. And I think Delidze can absolutely take that path here. So, I'm taking Delidze here. I'm taking the guy who I think is much more durable, who can land a big shot on the feet, or just simply get this fight down to the mat. Give me Delidze to win this fight by decision. co event. Diego Lopez going against Brian Ortega. We got Lopez, 28 years old, 5'11", with a 72 and a half inch reach, 24 and 6". And 4-1 and in his last five fights, Brian Ortega, 33 years old, 5'8", with a 69-inch reach, 16-3, and 2-3 and and in his last five fights. Diego Lopez opened up as a plus-130 underdog. He's now minus-150. Brian Ortega opened up minus-150. He's currently plus-130. And, um, yeah, this is one of those fights where I'm not picking against Diego Lopez. I mean, you guys can if you want. I just can't do it. I can't pick against this guy, and it's, it's funny. Every single fight that Diego Lopez has been in thus far in the UFC, outside of the Evlova fight, which we know it was going to happen there, but you look at his opponents, and there's there's cases to be made for a lot of his opponents, and a lot of guys are, are continue to bet against Lopez because in the Tucker fight, you have Tucker, who's more experienced. He has uh, a BJJ black belt. He has probably the better striking. Like There's some reasons to like Tucker, and Diego Lopez subs him in 60 seconds. And then against Pat Sabatini, everybody was on... Pat Sabatini in the matchup. Well, most people. And, yeah, you can make a case for Pat, right? Like, Pat Sabatini can take him down, control him like Joe Anderson Brito did and like Evloev did, and Lopez knocks him out in a minute. And then, against Yusuf, a lot of people are on Yusuf. You know, Yusuf has fought the much better competition. He's just coming off of a main event fight. Yusuf should be able to stuff the takedowns, you know, be the better striker. And Lopez finishes him in a minute. So I'm, I'm going to continue picking this guy, you know, until he does take a, a big step up competition, which this is. This is a step up competition, but it's a it's a it's a fight where I feel like he can win because Brian Ortega. These guys are kind of similar, kind of similar. Like both guys have elite jujitsu. Both guys don't really have much wrestling at all. Both guys are comfortable off their back, comfortable on the ground, and then on the feet. Um, I really like the striking of Lopez. I think his striking's improved like a ton throughout his career. I like the power of Lopez. Um, Ortega has always really been like a punching bag, like very, very hittable, less than 50% strike in defense. So I worry about that for Ortega. Just, the, the problem I'm having is I don't think that Lopez is going to go out there and spark Brian Ortega. If he does, it would be an incredible, incredible thing to, to do. But it's just, I don't think he's going to starch him like he starts Sabatini, Tucker, or Yusuf. But I'm. I still think Lopez can win the fight. I think he can win. Uh, win the minutes at range on the feet. I think Lopez can land some big shots. I think he can really hurt Ortega as this fight goes on. I think Lopez will be fine. You know, I think the cardio should be fine as well. I don't think he's gonna slow down like a lot of people do. Uh, maybe like late, late in the fight, third round. But I think he'll be fine. So yeah, I think at the very least Lopez can can win a lot of minutes, win a lot of moments at range on the feet. And then if this fight hits the mat, it's just going to get very interesting. It's going to get very interesting. I don't think either guy's subbing either guy. So, yeah, I think Lopez wins this fight. Does he, does he, does he finish Ortega, though? That would be that would be something because Ortega really hasn't been finished. Um, you know, There was an injury in the Yair fight, which counts as a TKO, but he got injured. And then against Holloway, it was like a doctor stoppage. So he hasn't technically been, been finished. Maybe Lopez is the first guy to do it. Am I going to pick it? Um, I don't know, man. Maybe, like maybe, because Ortega just eats punches with his face, so maybe. You know what? I'll say Lopez does does knock him out here. I'll say he does knock him out. Give me Lopez to win this fight and win it by, by knockout, being the first one to officially uh, finish Brian Ortega. And then we got the main event here. Don't forget, guys, to comment down your significant strikes. $25 the first. If you get it on the dot, I'm going to double it. Nobody's got it on the dot in like a couple months, so hopefully somebody gets it here. 
But yeah, we got Pereira versus Prohashka, two really looking forward to this matchup. How can you not? Two fan favorites, two guys that, you know, how can anybody hate any, any of these guys? I mean, th this is going to be a phenomenal fight, just like the first one. We got Pereira, 36 years old, six foot fourth and 80 inch reach, 10 and two and four and one in his last five fights. Prohashka, 31 years old, six foot three with an 80 inch reach, 34 and one and four and one in his last five fights. Uh, Pereira opened up minus 150, currently minus 150. Yuri opened up plus 130, currently plus 130. And yeah, so I guess, you know, you go back and watch their first fight, and uh, Yuri was able to take down Pereira in the first round. Pereira was able to survive. The fight starts round two, and I'm not sure what it is with Yuri in, in round twos, but, you know, Yuri will come out trying to be, like, conservative. In, term, in terms of Yuri, like, conservative a little bit, kind of a feeling out process, if you will and like fighting smartish and then the second round hits and yuri just throws all of that out the window he turns into like a, a complete madman a complete psycho um and it's pretty much in all of us like every single round two for yuri brahashka is just a crazy experience the volkan uzdemir fight he's losing that first round gets hurt in the first round the second round comes around and he knocks out uzdemir like really bad knocked out dominic ray is really bad with that spinning um it was a spinning back elbow and then against uh even like in the their first fight yuri starts just charging forward reckless abandon hands down and he gets caught against alexander rakic one of the most exciting second rounds um of the year in that fight where rakic was looking good early and then Yuri just turns into a madman and just walks down Rakic until he breaks him and finishes. I mean, that was incredible to see. So I don't know what it is with Yuri in round two, but I have a feeling this fight is is potentially going to end in, in, in the second round just with the way this guy comes out of there. Um, yeah, in terms of picking a winner, I'm going Pereira. And, th and here's why. I don't think Yuri's going to wrestle. I don't think he's going to get this fight down to the mat. It's not his game. Never has been. Never will be. That's not his game. That's not what he wants to do. And if he, even if he does that here, like Alex Pereira, that's all he's been working on. I don't think it's going to be a factor. Uh, Yuri has not gotten one, one, more than one takedown. And I don't think any fight ever that I've seen, he has not gotten more than one takedown. So I think this fight's going to take place standing. And, and when it does, Pereira just has too many weapons that I think are going to pose problems for Yuri. The first one is going to be the leg kicks. We saw Alexander Rakic completely destroy the legs of Yuri Brahashka. Uh, Rakic ended up getting away from that for some reason, which I thought was interesting. But because Yuri was kind of like done, it looked like. Uh, so yeah, the leg kicks for Pereira are going to be a factor. And then of course, the, the left hook that has a ton of power uh, as well. Yuri Brahashka has a 41% striking defense, which... I thought it was going to be closer to zero because he, he literally doesn't have striking defense. His striking defense is like headbutting punches with with his head. Um, he literally, he, he's the definition of eating punches, which which is great. I mean, it's fun to watch. And if anybody can pull it off, it's Yuri because he does. He's been, he's able to eat a ton of shots. But eating a, a left hook against Alex Pereira, I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. So, yeah, give me Pereira here. I'm hoping yeah, this fight. This fight is going to be fun, but I'm hoping we get like a Madman Yuri type second round where he just comes forward, and I think the the finishing sequence happens um, around around there and around that second round. So give me Pereira to finish Yuri Prohashka. Prohashka, fun fighter, dangerous fighter, too hittable for my liking. Give me Alex Pereira second round knockout, left hook, and. Uh, just like last time. And I know it's it's crazy to predict the fight the same exact way, but that's literally how I see it. I see second-round knockout for Alex Pereira. Pre uh, Proshka has had four four fights finish in the second round out of five. So, yeah, give me Alex Pereira by second-round knockout. There you guys have it. Thank you so much for watching. If you guys could, like on your way out. Subscribe to the channel. Let's try to get as many likes on this video as possible. If you guys want more content, check out DFSbythenumbers.com. have nine bets already looking to add honestly a lot more uh, full card best bet article will be out earlier in the week as well i'm about halfway done with that on a tuesday and yeah that's about all i got guys um check out the content throughout the week doing a ton of extra content for ufc 303 and best of luck guys enjoy the card it should be a fun one and we'll talk to you soon see you later